This is the worst of the Dan Lebatard show with the Stugatz podcast. A texter writes in, please have fake Howard Cosell call your race. <laughs> do we have to figure out how to do this? Do we have to figure out how to have a show race? Because some people are writing in here, if you guys sold tickets to this race, it would sell out in seconds. I think people overestimate our ability to get loyalty from our audience, even though the audience loyalty is pretty crazy. I don't think we could sell out anything for a foot race of the show, but I do want to do this. <laughs> and I am curious who people think will win. Allison was offended before the show when I said that she would finish last. Yeah. And she, she all of a sudden, next thing I know, I turn around, like I'm just doing a funny thing where I'm running sprints where, you know, with a cigar. And next thing I know, I got hashtag me too saying, Hey, I'm not back here. I'm up here. I'm in front of you. I don't even know what happened there. I'm just having a fun <laughs> conversation about a race. Took a weird turn. And you guys made it sound like uh, conversations that I usually have about race. I think we'd get a good crowd, man. Like I do. I like. Let's just say we do it at a high school track. I think we could fill the bleachers. I do. If we did a 100-yard dash, it's me, you, the shipping container, Joey Galloway. I mean, I think we could draw a big crowd. All right, this is where this story got started, and we do a lot of, as you know, we are a marching band to know where we're also a flying saucer of BS, so we do a lot of talking around here about things we're going to do that we never get around to doing. Mm. Uh, Stugat still has a 10-year-old uh, debt to a local professional goalkeeper that he said he could score on at will in penalty kicks. We did that 10 years ago. We talked about that on air. Yeah. Never got around to doing it. Also, uh, I owe Matt Mitrione a bet in Milwaukee where I think I'm supposed to run in a sausage race because he defeated in UFC Kimbo Slice. Hmm. Kimbo Slice is no longer with us. That's how long ago that was. He no longer roams the earth. Right. You're also supposed to race Joey Galloway, and Greg was supposed to kick field goals, but he got injured the first kick, I think. Wait a minute. But at least he went. I mean... No, this fraud Galloway, it's time to call him back out. Yeah. This guy has been telling us forever that he could run a 4 one at 40 years old, and we've been challenging him to prove it. I think we offered a lot of money. I think I got in trouble. Didn't we get in trouble with ESPN for, like, offering Joey Galloway a lot of money on air if he could ever prove that at 40 years old he can still run a 4-1? He's 46 now. I know. It's ridiculous. We must have because he just disappeared. He did. He The only thing he did fast was disappear. <laughs> Greg was also supposed to race an elephant. Oh, yeah. That's true. Oh, yeah that's well, right. no, but you can't make an elephant run. McGill told me that. He's like, Dan, elephants run whenever they want to. <laughs> Can you guys put that on the poll? Did you know that you can't make an elephant run? Because I didn't know that. I feel like if you put a jockey on an elephant, he'll probably go. No, elephant goes when the elephant wants to go. Ron taught us that. Don't mice scare elephants? Just oh, put yeah. a bunch of mice around it, right? I think that's a myth. Hmm. Wow. Isn't that a myth? Look that up for me. I don't think that's actually true. I think you're just believing, like, the cartoons. I don't believe that that's a thing. Are we involving everyone in this uh, in this race? Like, is Greg Cody in? Is Sarah Spain? Is Pablo Torre? I got to see Pablo run. I have to. I, I mean, <laughs> I that's fine. Run. I think the more the merrier. I mean, I think <laughs> I think we can say with a good degree of certainty that Dominique Foxworth is going to be the winner of this race. Yeah, that we he have. shouldn't be there. He shouldn't be there. Uh, do you think Pablo owns sneakers? Um, That's a great question. And do you think he'd show up to the race in a sweater? I, we need to do this now. We need to do this with everybody. Uh, who, Who's finishing last in this race? Not that I should talk, but can you picture Pablo at the gym? No. No, it's hard to imagine. Yeah, because he's wearing a sweater everywhere. Like, you don't, you don't go to the gym and think of sweaters. By the way, speaking of sweaters, we were discussing during the local hours, do you think that the Warriors would win the title in snow gear? 
because I think Houston's going to make that hard. Houston makes 10 threes last night in the fourth quarter. So that's the I record. Know, 10 know. in the fourth quarter. A game against Minnesota was close. Minnesota feels great about itself. This is fun. This is great basketball. Boom. Buried in the fourth quarter because Houston on the road hits 10 threes in the right. third quarter. That's And again, you just said it. At Minnesota, 42 points on the road in the fourth quarter. I mean, I, I've watched them so much this season. There is nothing you can do when they're hitting those shots. Uh, Thibodeau, Thibodeau <laughs> is known for defense, right? And it doesn't matter. Basketball's changed so much right so they wouldn't actually beat the rockets in snow gear but put it on the poll anyways at levitar show would the warriors win the title wearing snow gear first question to pablo torre who none of us can imagine ever having gone to the gym or owning sneakers uh we'll get to that in a second but first do you think that the warriors would win the title wearing snow gear Pablo? Hello. Yeah. I have a lot of sneakers. Hold on a second, Pablo. We didn't ask you That's that That's not yet. what I asked you yeah. yet. Do you think that the Warriors would win the title in snow gear? With sneakers, though, right? Yeah, sneakers. Sneakers you know, and High snow tops, gear. but yeah. snow gear. Yeah. So not snow shoes. We're just talking about, like, parkas and stuff. But, right. yeah, and yes. mittens, though. Mittens or mittens gloves, gloves. Like, zero-degree yeah. weather. Zero-degree weather. I feel like the Warriors would not win the NBA title if they couldn't use their hands or really jump. Uh, so how how where well, would they playoff go? team though, where, right? A three seed. Yeah, I would say like they make the Western Conference Finals. <laughs> the title. Okay, how many sneakers do you own? I own like I mean this is embarrassing. I own probably like I don't know three dozen pairs. All right, so he's a sneakerhead. How about running shoes? But he's Ex- a collector. But he doesn't wear them. shoes. That's yeah, the you're thing. wearing yeah. them to look good. You're not wearing them to for. To be useful, are you? Well, that, that's the thing is that I own probably like two dozen Adidas Ultra Boost running shoes that I have never used to run. <laughs> okay. Well, let me ask you this question. How have do you, you ever ran? How do you think, have you ever run? Do you think, <laughs> do you think you would finish anything other than last in a foot race uh, on of this what, show? Of this show. What distance are we talking? Uh, about what well, we've been talking about between 40 yards and 100 yards. Oh, I, I feel like I would be, I mean, how many people are on the show that were racing? Well, it's everyone. It's Dominique. It's Allison. Let's say Dominique. It's, it's Super this. Dave Osborne. It's Mike Dominique Lowell. The whole this. thing is weird, but I just, it's Joey Galloway, but just where do you think you're we're, finishing? Listen, we're taking Galloway and Foxworth out of it. They'll run, but they're not competing with us. We're not and, doing that. I think it'd be funny to have him <laughs> do a hundred yard race where Galloway and Foxworth finish 70 yards before we do. That's fine, but it doesn't count in the overall standings. Uh, and don't worry about Lowell. He'll finish last. So where do you think? Like, what do you think is happening here? Among the people who have never been paid to run as part of their job description, <laughs> I feel yeah. like I would be in the top three. What? No way. What? No All right. Way. All right. This well, now we got to do it. Now we got to do it. All right. Now we got to do it. I'm in, and I will unleash all of the energy that my sneakers have well. stored and <laughs> have yet to unleash on you. Who are you thinking you lose to in this scenario? I have trouble figuring out how fast, like, Billy and Roy are and Mike. Like, those are the guys I'm kind of respecting. Sorry, Chris. Uh, those are the guys I'm kind of respecting. Um, how about Mina? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be. Yeah, you are. Hashtag me too. Be careful. <laughs> be careful. But are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't think he's kidding. I think Allison was offended that we had her finish, finishing last. I mean, fair, I guess, but I would dust, I would dust both of you specifically. Well, see, this is what you don't know about me. All right. uh, We're going to let him go on that note. And now we're going to start organizing this race and see when Pablo can fly down here so we would have a foot race because I think he's underestimating, uh, he dust me. There will be no dusting of me by Pablo. Dan runs on the beach. My very clean sneakers are about to get real dirty in the service of Ooh. dusting you. All right. All right. All right. We'll see what happens here. Okay. Put it down. But I think the way Dan needs the – you need the race to be longer. You need it to be like well, this 200 is the yards. Thing. Dan doesn't yes. really hit top totally. speed until that's, about 100 the, yards. Yes, and that's not 100 <laughs> yards, but about 40. What you're going to hear huffing and puffing its way into your life, Pablo, and you better fear it, is something that comes without brakes over those last 60 yards, and it's coming to get you. I feel like I should wear a splash guard for the sweat that's going to yeah, it's going. You're going to feel it on the side of your face as I leave you behind. <laughs> Trail of tears. 
Splash. Is Cody involved in this race? Yes. <laughs> Pablo's not finishing top three in a show race. Put it on the poll, please. There's At no Levitard way. Show, is Pablo finishing top three in a show race? ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Home Insurance. Getting a quote is easier than ever. Here's your Sports Center update. A fluffy Bijan Freeze named Flynn won best of show at the Westminster Dog Show. Westminster. Minister. Westminster. Did I just do that? Westminster Dog Show. Ray Allen, who was absent from Paul Pierce's jersey retirement, said that there is nothing but love for Pierce. Fraud. This Sports Center is brought to you by J.C. Penny. There's more to love at J.C. Penny this Valentine's Day. Come in for great gifts at sweet prices like fine and fashion jewelry, heart fine jewelry, or a Sephora fragrance sampler. Get in now and find what you love only at J.C. Penny. For all the latest headlines and information. Tune in the Sports Center on ESPN Radio all throughout the day. What you and Pablo underestimate is long strides. <laughs> you guys underestimate that it takes you guys 15 steps. When this giraffe starts moving, <laughs> one step is like 15 of yours. You're not a giraffe. The man. elephant. When this elephant starts moving, when this elephant feels like running. Don Lebertard. Today during the break, you would have marveled at all of the people, male and female, that he said aren't going to age well. Keep those names to ourselves, Dad. Otherwise attractive people that Stugatz was just totally comfortable saying, she's not going to age well. He's not going to age well. Stugatz. And I'm staring at him. And he's unshaven and he's wearing flip-flops and he's wearing a 12-year-old t-shirt. And Stugatz, like, he can feel my my judgment. And you know what he says to me? I still got it. I do. I, I feel like if I were out on the open market, I'd be having a field day. This is the Don Levatar Show with the Stugatz on ESPN Radio. You saw last night, Stugatz, what happened in Oklahoma basketball. Oklahoma basketball has been popular this year uh, because they play fun. They play from deep. They've got a player who feels like Steph Curry. Yeah, Trey Young. Trey Young. Yeah. And um, you saw what happened. They're not very good. He was 0 for 9 yesterday from 3. And when that style doesn't make it shot, it is not a fun style of basketball. Um, Oklahoma, Trey Young is being talked about. He's the biggest star in college basketball right now, right? Because he's a novelty and he plays kind of like Steph. He's easily the biggest star in college basketball. And he's a guy who can put up 30 and 30 and 10 on you. Yeah. And it's not nor That's not a normal stat line for a college kid. No, it? they're 16 and nine now. Uh, you want that kid. You want that team to be in the NCAA tournament because you want to see that kid. That's the kind of kid that could take, if he gets hot, can take that team to yeah, the but final man, four. Does it look bad when he's 0 for nine? And what is that team? What is Oklahoma on the season? Because they've been tumbling in the rankings. They're 16 and nine. They're six and seven in the conference. They got off to a good start and they've been really bad lately. And he hasn't been great lately. Mm -hmm. Um, they've lost. Now, they played Texas Tech last night. He's a very good team. And I heard Bill is talking about this. One of the best defensive teams in the country. Mm -hmm. So they lost that game in Texas Tech. I believe it's seventh in the country right now. But Oklahoma's lost. Uh, they've lost four straight. I've got to ask you guys a question because it just happened and I'm confused by it. Today is Valentine's Day. If you're just learning this, get on it, man. You have really bleeped up and you need to fix it quick. If you're just learning this now. Can you imagine someone in their car right there are now like smacking their forehead? No, there's, there are plenty of people that are doing that right now. Today <laughs> is Valentine's Day. But this just happened. The security guard just wished me a happy Valentine's Day. Wow. Was it Steven? The guy with the long hair? Yes. Oh, he's nice. That was well, nice. Did you say it back? No. I, no, Whoa. I didn't. You didn't say it back? What'd this you is, say? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This and, guy, hold I on. Mean, it's hold his on. job to protect us. I want to be, hold on. I want to be careful about this. This is not homophobic. I'm simply wondering if the security guard, a man, had said Happy Valentine's Day to you, would you have found it unusual? That's what I'm asking. At Levitard Show, because I've had two men today wish me a happy Valentine's Day, and I think it's the first time that's ever happened in my life, and it's happened now twice on the same day. Well, who was the, uh, if you don't mind us asking? Um, well, I don't want to embarrass him uh -oh. if this is indeed embarrassing. I can't tell looking at the faces in the other room if this is embarrassing. It's not at all. Bruce came around and he all gave us Valentine's Day chocolate. Oh, that's oh, the, wait nice. a minute. That's the third thing that happened. Bruce, okay. Bruce, I don't nice. know how to explain to you what Bruce looks like, but for the ESPNU audience, can you just bring him in here? He's got the biggest hands, okay, it, uh, among anyone on the show. 
Bruce, if if you know what, do me a favor here. Hold on, let's do it this way. He's a bear of a man. He's a well, beautiful man. Well, but Where on. do you think he finished in the hold, race? Hold, hold on a second. I think he'd finish with Allison, well behind me. Um, but you know what? I don't want to just bring Bruce in here. I want a whole lineup of the people who work on our show, and I want people to be able to decide on ESPNU who looks least likely to show up with two heart-shaped chocolates today, just based on nothing more than physical appearance. Now, we're doing this on television. I don't mean this to the exclusion of the radio audience. I will explain this as well to the radio audience. But right now, you're going to get a treat if you're watching just on ESPNU because we're going to bring every camera person and every person who works here, and we're going to create a police lineup behind behind Billy and Roy. Right. And I want you to look at those people and tell me who is least likely to show up today <laughs> with two heart-shaped chocolates. Well, it's probably not going to be Janicky since we said his name is Bruce already. Um, so that's a bit of a, a Now tip. bring everyone in and I just want the visual image. I want the I want people to understand right. that what I walked into today was two chocolates like we all had, two heart-shaped chocolates on our desk. We should also take a picture of this, guys, and put it on social media. Put it on Twitter and let the listeners <laughs> ask them the same question on social media. Somebody take a picture of this. Got to take a picture. And I'll take the picture since everyone's lining okay, up. Okay, let's everybody, everybody who works on the show in the picture. Who's that? Who's that? Okay. One person I've never seen. That. Is that it? There, we got more people. Where's Arnaldo? Where's Arnaldo? There's a lot of people that work on this show. You'd you think, think it'd be you, better. You would think it'd be better. Yeah. Good God. Look at this army. We're getting everybody in here. And the question to the ESPNU audience, Arnaldo, make sure to get in there. Roy, you take the picture, please. Can you take the picture or are you too close? Uh, I will take the picture. Um, and so there's our there's our staff. I want you to tell us who is least likely to produce two heart-shaped chocolates and put them on the desk today among that cast of characters. <laughs> Because it's fairly bleeping amazing. It was a big upset. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time. Thanks for the we got the. Do we have what we need? We got the picture that we need. We'll put it on the... Hold on. Uh, everyone stay for a sec. I just think it's unusual. Um, <laughs> I would think it's unusual as well if a guy said happy Valentine's to me. Uh, but I would get past it quickly, and then I would be nice and and say, yeah, you know what, happy Valentine's. You would. I would, yeah. I get past it. I get past the awkwardness and the odd, you know, the odd feelings that I have, and then I would just say, yeah, happy Valentine's. It's a nice thing. I mean, you just. I, be I know, nice. but it's weird, though. Is it not weird? Am I wrong about this? Because it's never happened to me before, and today, now, you just reminded me of the heart. It's happened to me three times. It's ten twenty four Eastern. In I've been. Wish to have a Valentine's Day in some form by three different men in my life today. So you just like grunted back because you didn't say it back. I didn't say it back. No, I was very repressed about it. I did not. But the first time I got it, my response was thank you. And I didn't mean that either. It's good to know our security guard is alive. (laughs) He was awake. Maybe not. Maybe we woke him. That happens sometimes. So what are you going to do? Like moving forward here, plenty of people are going to wish you a happy Valentine's Day mm-hmm. today. They are. They're going to wish. I'm, I'm Dan. I'm no, telling you. No, I'm asking you guys if it feels weird. That's what I'm asking you. At Lebetard Show on Twitter is how you reach us. Happy Valentine's. Don Lebetard. Stugat's talking about movies is one of the most amazing things you'll ever see. He says he wants to know in a movie's title what a movie's about, and he was just yelping and complaining. Stugatz. Well, I mean, Dances with Wolves, which is one of the most overrated movies in the history of movie making. The guy never dances with a wolf. If the title of the movie is going to be Dances with Wolves, then I want to see a guy dancing with wolves. Costner never did it. Right. You're waiting Soft. three hours or for, for a guy to dance with a wolf. This is the Don Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. Ron McGill going to join us later in the show. Chris Sims going to be on with us as well. Kevin Arnovitz with us now. He's uh, our basketball guy. He knows his stuff, ESPN, the magazine. Uh, I guess I guess we'll start here. Uh, the Warriors, uh, where would they finish if we made them play in snow gear? Uh, they've got to be wearing uh, their high tops, but otherwise uh, they're dressed for zero degree temperatures. Uh, where where do you put that team? Are we talking like the kid in the Christmas story, like with 
like your parents will put you in. It's zero degrees, Arnovit. It's zero degrees. We're saying big Parker jacket, dress, like gloves, dress, dress yes. accordingly. It's yes. not thirty. No pants. It's not thirty-five. You might need gloves or mittens. All right. So, like Steph, I think could shoot thirty-seven percent and mummified, basically from okay. three-point range. Okay. Clay's stroke, like he, he he's flying around this. He gets slowed, so he's now from down from forty-five percent from three to like probably thirty-three. So I don't know, like, like maybe fifty-two wins. Okay. So minus right. eleven, yeah. Okay. Championship or right. so the, the Rockets the get them in the conference finals. They're the Thunder. They're yeah. the Thunder. Yeah, they're, they're essentially a three seed in the West okay. with right. snow gear. <laughs> so they can win it all, though. I mean, <laughs> I mean they could. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, but, unlikely. The Rockets from three probably better than the Warriors from three with mittens. Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> well, that's where we are with this season, though, right, Arnovitz? It's basically going to come down to, in a seven-game series, who can make more threes between Houston and Golden State. That's where we are with the math in this sport, aren't we? I mean, yeah, but like also, like Houston defensively, to me, is the story, right? Like, like we knew this was going to happen. We knew they were going to be a juggernaut. They actually defend. And that was, if you told me, hey, this Mike D'Antoni team with James Harden as the, one of the principal guards, and hey, Trevor's getting older, and Ryan Anderson's out there 25 minutes a night, like, can they at all? Because that's never been the question is, oh, can they score enough? It, it's, you know, the Warriors play a top five brand of defense when they're engaged, really a top three, and the Rockets are the Rockets. And that's, to me, been the, like where the margins closed is the Rockets actually defend well, can pretty you, well. Can you explain that? Because that doesn't, you know, that's not like a D'Antoni sta- uh, staple right there and when you have James Harden as you mentioned the center of that how are they so good defensively it has to be the other okay. guys right right all right so you got now you have Chris Paul up top you have Crin Capel, Capel in the middle you devise a scheme that's kind of warriors ass that allows people to switch this means that now James Harden isn't pathetically trying to fight through screens you you bring in Luke Mamute, PJ Tucker you've got Trevor Reaver who Reaver is still long and smart defensively you can hide Anderson a little bit and so all of a sudden your personnel Looks like, you know, 80% of the guys who get real minutes on that team are well above average defenders, and you hide the other two and play whack-a-mole. Why does the guy that you hide on defense so often look like Ryan Anderson? Does he, why does he look like Ryan like, Anderson? Like, yeah, why is it always Corver? Like, is he in a Ryan Anderson suit or something? No, just the whole thing. Just Ryan Anderson. Kyle Corver. Well, he's also saying James Harden. Like, I, I, like, Isaiah I, Thomas. Isaiah Thomas is another guy you try to hide on defense. What's the list of guys you try to hide on defense? Oh, this is good. Um, yes. All right, so like, you're going by team, like hiding on defense. Uh, like, who else do you hide? I'm like, I'm, I'm going through like the major teams. Yeah, Isaiah, very small point guards who aren't named Chris Paul or Mike Conley. Um, like, like dedicated three point shooters whose only real discernible skill is doing that. Like Ryan Anderson. I'm trying to think of the other guys. <laughs> in the league. You know, like Kevin Love was one of those guys, but I actually think he's always gotten a slightly bad rap. I'm not going to sit here and tell you he's like this grand well, good let, protector. Let, but let me I, ask but, you this, Kevin, though, as an expert in this field, and again, Kevin Arnovitz with us, ESPN the magazine, how do you measure individual defense, you personally? This is the Bermuda Triangle of all the analytics and everything we've been trying to discern. That We have an answer for everything, and we don't really have an answer. You have the eye test, and then you get, like, we have some good metrics. This defensive real plus minus that uh, – some really smart guys developed it at ESPN, and you can go kind of deep, deep in the stat filter if you if you go to the site. Like it's pretty good. And the reason you know it's good is when you start sorting by defensive real plus minus. The list looks exactly like like guys that you know, like like Andre Robertson before he got injured, like 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 twice as good as the next guy uh, at his position. And and I think that's a really good one. I mean, to me, it's sort of like does if you're a guard, how do I judge it? How long is the big man on the pick and roll? like holding down the four while you fight through that screen. And if you see like big men just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for that guard, you know, um, then, then, you know, I, I, as a guard, I don't, I don't think much of your defense, like, like how quick do you react as a big man to the action? Are you there under the rim protecting it when you're supposed to, or like historically you Zach Randolph, who's still kind of wrestling with the power forward on the other side. And, oh man, they're coming my way. Do I move now? And I mean, I think that's the eye test. And then you kind of filter it through kind of some reliable stats and hey is the team successful you talk to coaches and if you you know, have access to and say like is this guy as bad as he looks or as good as he looks and and that's how you do it i guess i don't know it's it's still the great bermuda triangle i don't feel like we coaches don't i don't feel like coaches even know i don't feel like a coach can tell you with certainty this guy is great at defense am i wrong 
I mean, this is always the great thing. I, I don't think you're wrong at all. Like, take a guy like Ray Allen. We're talking about Ray Allen, right? Like, that dude was the starting two on the worst defensive team in history when he was in Seattle. He goes to Boston, like, and you're telling me the next season that team is the best defensive team in the history of basketball statistically? Well, how do you do that with a guy who is the one of the primary wing defenders, like, at a key position? So wait a minute. You, so, so you, Kevin Arnovitz, who knows as much about basketball as anyone I know, you look at the Boston Celtics last year and you simply can't figure no. out why they're good at defense when Isaiah Thomas no, clearly about, stinks at defense? I'm talking about the 08 9 team. I'm talking about no, no, no. I know, but I'm saying Joker. I'm making it broader than that. I'm saying... You last year Celtics team, could you tell right. why it was good at defense and was it because it had good defensive players? Yeah, I mean I think you, you, you can kind of see it's like you walk into a house and if it if the magazines are in order on the coffee table and everything's in the right place, that's a neat house. Like you can watch and say, Oh look, there's Al Horford there calling out calls to his point guards to Avery Bradley, who's just a very good listener who like knows how to, <laughs> right. you know, react to actions and it looks like you know when the, when Spo when Eric Spolster says everyone's on a string and we kind of roll our eyes. It kind of makes sense. It like, does it look like good marionettes? Like, are they all kind of moving in tan, you know, in tandem and in trio and in and, and sync? Or is it does it look like an absolute fire drill? This like, is keeping you up and, at and, night, and, Arnovitz. This is keeping you up at night, right? It's killing you. Oh I can God, hear it in your voice. Like, yeah. what are you thinking about NBA defenses. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to you soon, Kevin. Are we going to talk about the Cavs at all? No. Uh, all right, give us thirty seconds. Thirty of the best seconds you got on the Cavs. We're out of time. Everybody's told, oh well, they got guys who can now cover the perimeter or they bring energy. No, LeBron is the showrunner on a prestige drama. He didn't like the writers in the room. He didn't like the characters on the scene, so he fired. He killed off a bunch of characters. This was a – I mean, LeBron was bored. And everyone was, oh, well, they, need, they need better defenders on the perimeter. Yeah, Isaiah Thomas is not going to do the job, and George Hill's pretty long, and Rodney Hood's pretty engaged, and, the, and you know, Larry Nance Jr. is an active guy that they needed. But this was about LeBron as prestige TV, HBO drama showrunner being unhappy with the cast and unhappy with his writer's room. And that's what this was. And now he's no longer bored. There's no statistical basis for the improvement. There's no, it, there, there's no scheme that it work now. No one, it's not, it's not even, Kemp, it is LeBron James's world. And he's the showrunner. And, that, yes. and he wanted to, he wanted to kill off JR or whatever. Yes or no. And just yes or no. LeBron James, if I do nothing else other than put him on the Kings and move the Kings to the East, LeBron James wins the East with the Kings. No. Where does he finish? And that's a statement on the Kings, not LeBron. Where does he finish? Like, probably uh, Boston, Toronto, Kings. All right, so like the same where the Warriors would finish in snow gear. In snow gear. In snow gear, though. If the Bucks, if this is real with the Bucks, maybe fourth. All right. I want to see a few more weeks of the Bucks. All right. See you later, Arnavit. Do you want more of the Dan Levata show with the Stugats? Tune in starting at 10 Eastern on ESPN Radio on ESPNU. Hi, everyone. Stu Gatz here. Support for the Dan Levitard Show podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, and your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently to get started. Go to rocketmortgage.com slash Stugatz, S-T-U-G-O-T-Z, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Don Lebatard. So he was on Wingo and Golick, and I am told uh, this is uh, Golick and Wingo. Excuse me. Whoa. That's yeah. a fun. Wow. No, that's not a fun. Wow. What do you mean? No, what? That's not, wow. a, that's not the name it. of the show. That's that not the name of the show. That is not a fun. It only had 8 yep. million ads. $2, two two names wrong, up. right? No, and be careful on tone. That's all I'm saying. $2, fork it up. Stugats. You want me to front you? No, no, uh, thank you. Good, because I don't have any money on This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. Gosh, this is funny here. I like the idea of this. Can we do some of this by text machine? A texter writes in, does Bill Belichick's or Belichick's Valentine's Day card to his girlfriend just read, we're on to St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> no days off. Like, we could have some fun here. We could have some fun with people in sports and what their Valentine's Day is like. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yes, we can. Yes. Because I'm. this is what I'm asking you. I've talked to you about this in the, in the past, about the idea that 
Tony La Russa, Bobby Knight, and Bill Parcells as friends, they probably talk to each other the way you guys talk to your friends in college or in high school or at work if you're in your 20s. But they're just doing it much older. So I'm wondering if Parcells and La Russa, you guys are telling me, everyone's looking at me like I'm weird. If Parcells called La Russa and wished him a happy Valentine's Day or even texted him it, do you think it'd be weird? Do you think you'd think it's weird if Bob Knight were texting Bill Parcells, hey, happy V-Day, big guy? <laughs> yeah, Bob Knight doesn't seem like a v <laughs> You know what I'm guy. saying, though? Who are right. the people in sports? Who are the people in sports that you would look at and say to yourself, that person gets Valentine's Day right. J.J. Watt gets it exactly right. J. And J. it's Watt all over up. social media. I'm sure he's telling someone about it right now. I'm going to check his social media right now. He's wished all the grandmas out there a happy Valentine's Day. He had it set at 8 a.m. this morning. I have no question about this. I'm checking it out. He's going door to door as Cupid for sure today. Yeah. J.J. Watt? Yeah. Yeah. He owns today, Dan. And I'm not sure how you're arriving at this. I'd love to know your theories, though. I can't wait to hear your theories on this. He's J.J. Watt. He, he does everything by the book. He does everything right. So you think he's got on social media a scavenger hunt for his lady and, as well, a happy Valentine's Day to all the grandmas out there? 100%. All right, so who does Valentine's Day better than J.J. Watt? <laughs> Who's the guy? You're saying that because J.J. Watt does appearances well. Yeah, of course. Yes, he does appearances well. He does everything well, except but, sack uh, the don't, quarterback. Don't we... I hadn't done that in a while. Don't we have somewhere some audio from a bad reality show or dating show where J.J. Watt has had an awkward dating moment in front of us? I feel like I remember that somewhere, but I might have that wrong. I might be confusing him with someone. Jim Harbaugh can't do Valentine's Day well, right? Well, see, that's just what I'm talking about. Nice work by you, Cody. He, uh, Guillermo, put this on the poll. Just like he said it, Jim Harbaugh can't do Valentine's Day right, right? Like, there's just no way that he does that correctly, right? <laughs> it's not possible. Uh, there's no, no, there is no way he's doing that right. But how do you think Belichick does Valentine's Day? Like, do you think it's breakfast in bed? I could see, like, Belichick being a sneaky romantic. I can. Well, he's not, he is not bashful about kissing his lady in public and he is not bashful about dating publicly. You know who I think is sneaky good at Valentine's Day? Nick Saban. Oh, wow. Oh, he speaks very highly of his wife and he doesn't mind telling everybody that she's in charge. He puts on his crimson jacket yeah. and nothing nice else meal. and mm. nothing else, my friends and nothing else. You guys think Tebow does it better than JJ Watt? He, He'd probably be so obnoxious with it. <laughs> How do you think Tebow does it? You think just, it's just? Well, I think too, Tebow goes out of the, too out many of, balloons. Oh, he sending, goes out of his way to ruin your game. He's, like, yes, yeah, he's yes, sending flowers yes. to her work, yes. to her home. Yeah. Like, yeah. get over it. <laughs> They're in the car. <laughs> everywhere that she turns, there's flowers. <laughs> everywhere she turns, the entire day, someone is there with flowers, and it's man. It might be an, an actual angel. Like, not someone dressed as an angel, but an actual angel putting flowers there. The, there so no, no one, uh, that means no one does Valentine's Day better than Tebow then, right? You guys may think it's too much. No, because she has to enjoy Valentine's Day. At, at a certain point, she's like, I wait mean, a second. Am wait I opening a flower shop? What am I going to do with all of this? Wait a second. I mean, A-Rod is crushing today, is he? <laughs> is he? How is he crushing it? He's signing so many. He's sending a thousand flowers to the house with the note, Macho 13. Macho number 13. He's buying out like a whole restaurant. Oh, for yeah. sure. Oh, well, wait a minute. Didn't we? Who were those pop stars? Who were the, the young pop stars? Was it Bieber? They had an actual Valentine's date at the forum where they were served dinner. Was it Selena? Would it have been Selena? Gomez. Gomez. I'm not, I'm not good at audit. this stuff, but exactly I'm pretty you... sure you guys could look up for me a ridiculous Valentine's Day specific celebration by, I don't think it was Timberlake. I think it was Bieber where they rented out the Lakers facility to have dinner there. Probably not the forum though, right? Well, the forum was a long time ago. Whatever they're calling the forum these days, you'll forgive me. Uh, one of the many things that has gone with age is stadium name. The Staples Center. Yeah, it's Fine. been the Staples Center since like 1995, right? He rented a uh, Staples Center, and he did. Very good, Dan. Surprise, Selena Gomez. Well, what are the details, though? I'd like to go over some of the details 
in in what it is that he did because Justin Bieber is the guy that makes all the other guys look terrible on Valentine's Day. There was a private screening of Titanic. Right. It's pretty good. I mean, yeah. Bieber. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's awful, Allison. I mean, that movie's the worst. Oh, Titanic worst. is yeah, awful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you lost me you weren't saying, okay, yeah. they lo- they lose your romance right there with Titanic is the movie. They also started the night with a Demi Lovato concert. Oh. She's so talented, Dan, Demi Lovato. Yeah, she she's good. Yeah. Was the concert there? Was it a private concert or they went elsewhere and started a, with a Demi? <laughs> no, the concert was next door at the Nokia Theater. And then they went next door. They watched Titanic. God. Was it or was it not dinner on the court? Yeah, I think they had. I think they had people come out and serve them dinner on the court, which would be really weird. I don't think I'd like that. Would you like that? <laughs> okay, I don't know. I mean, it seems like it'd be kind of antiseptic. But if you're a romantic person, do I strike you as a romantic? You? If you're a romantic, but that was a rhetorical question. Thank you, Billy. Don Lebatard. I'd like to be a dog, man. It <laughs> seems like such a great lifestyle. You, know, you sleep all day. You wait for everyone to come home. They rub your belly. They take you for a walk, and they just throw treats at you. Stugats. I mean, I feel like you're kind of this show's pet, though, aren't you? Kind of. I mean, look at you today. <laughs> who's good? I mean, who's good? Who's good? We groomed Stugats. <laughs> who's, who's good? Who's good? <laughs> who's good? This is the Don Lebatard show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. Hold up. Hold up. What happened? Hold what up. Happened? What hold up. happened? Hold up. Before you read anything, before you do anything, <laughs> please make the Oprah Winfrey correction that you need to make and then explain to me how this was a mistake that got made here. All please right. make the correction now. This was the end of the uh, 11 o'clock Sports Center. I've only gotten a thousand texts about it. And finally, Oprah Winfrey's real name was actually Oprah Winfrey. But people mispronounce it so much, he changed their name. I so think- it was always Winfrey. It was just, you know, people were pronouncing Orpa, Oprah. This is what I want to say to you, okay? I don't think I've ever been as mad about anything in my life yeah. as I am about this mistake. You came on here and you read that we've been pronouncing Oprah Winfrey's last name wrong, and then you told us how to pronounce it correctly, and you said Winfrey. Yep. And that's the news that you gave. And Roy told me during the break that he told you this and that you had this conversation, and then you came on air. Not so fast, my friend. I went to Roy, and I said, listen. Is it the first name or the last name? So people used to call her real name is Winfrey, and she just changed it to Winfrey because everyone just called her Winfrey. And he said, I thought he said yes. So I just ran with that. I told you it was the first name. Yeah, I didn't hear that. You don't listen. You ask questions, don't listen. Do what you want. Get all the facts wrong. Get a raise. Yep. Thank you. So it's Oprah Winfrey. (laughs) I mean, that's you. You would agree, though. That's Roy. Would you or would you not agree that that is a pretty dumb mistake? Yes or no? After having had the conversation, it is by Roy. (laughs) Also, that's a fine for blaming me. Oh, hopefully, I'll see if I have some money. (laughs) Oh, I really don't have any money today. This is bad. (laughs) Okay, you owe two dollars for what? For not having money? You do you not know what the fine system is? The fine system is you get fined a dollar every time that you make a mistake and blame it on someone else. Right, so that's one. If you don't have that dollar, you then owe another dollar for not having that dollar. If it is then learned that you do have cash in your pocket, the fine is another dollar. (laughs) So now let's go through his pocket. I mean, go through it if you want. Well, you owe at least $2. I owe at least $2. It's an IOU. I have no money. You guys can come and check the pockets if you want. And really, Roy should be fine. I mean, Roy. Whoa! No. Sorry. No. That's a, and I owe $3. Get in touch with the show anytime to the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed at Levitard Show at Stugat790 at DMarvelous5000. Said there's a tweet saying, Sprinting, gyrating Dan is a menace that will leave no mercy in its wake. Just a black hole-like blob sucking everything in its path up into his fat rolls. A little harsh, but funny. 
It's good enough to be a tweet of the day. We're going to send at the marvelous 5000 a 1 800 flowers gift card. Dan, it's time for Straight Talk. It's brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. If you've been listening to the show, we've been talking about a foot race involving the entire show. Everyone on the show, Dominique Foxworth says he has not and will not sprint unless it's for money. Atta boy. He, he only sprints for money. I want the visual image. We're trying to get a race. If you know, What we've got in play here, I have uh, told World Series MVP uh, Mike Lowell that I could beat him in a foot race. He has been invited to this foot race. Joey Galloway claims that he can run a 4-140 at 46 years old. He's full of it. That's that's fraud. Fraud. There's a guy on ESPN running around. He might be the fastest guy at ESPN. In fact, I'll give him that. Who is the fastest guy at ESPN? Oh, wow. I don't know if it's him anymore. Who is the fastest guy at ESPN? I mean, it might still be Joey Galloway. I might be willing to extend him that. Ryan Clark? Who would win a race? Go ahead and put it on the poll. Who wins a race between 46-year-old Joey Galloway and then whatever Ryan Clark's age is? But regardless, he said he could run a 4-140 at 40 years old, and it's nonsense, but we're going to put him in this race. Pablo Torre says he can beat me in a race. He's, he's going to finish in the top three. Right. But we were talking about my long strides. Like, I'm just chasing everyone down. The longer this race is, I'm going to chase everyone down from behind. Just because I, <laughs> I don't come with breaks and I've got very long strides. And once it gets moving, it's going to huff and puff past you at a high rate of speed. How does it stop? Do we need like a net or something? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. In fact, yes. And at the end of this race that we've created, Greg Cody's going to be in this race. Yes, you would catch me like you would an entangled whale <laughs> that's been caught in some some trap that you were trying to fish for something else at the bottom of the sea. That's exactly. I need to end up in one of those field goal nets, just running as fast as I can, and then just have at the end a field goal net. So, anyways, we're going to do this just so that you could see the visual of a hundred oh, yard man. sprint. See how far Dominique and Galloway get out in front of us. And then just sort through the the wreckage to see where everyone finishes sixth, seventh, and eighth. By the way, Randy Moss works at ESPN. Oh, <laughs> ooh, Randy Moss is. Oh, that'd be a good one though. Randy Moss and Galloway. Oh, Moss is beating Galloway, isn't he? Ooh. How old is Randy Moss? I mean, Galloway's forty six, Dan. <laughs> like he said it when he was forty. He continues to claim that every year he runs a four one forty. Josina Anderson ran track. Uh-huh. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. All right, well, put up, put this all on the poll. Who is the fastest person at ESPN? And then give people the answers. But Greg Cody is very likely to finish last. Greg Cody is the <laughs> grandfather of this show. Greg Cody thinks he's great at everything in sports, though. He thinks he can make threes in an NBA game. He actually said, we had this wager in place where I told him, Greg, for the rest of your life, because he thought he could make a 50-yard field goal. Yep. And I said, for the rest of your life, I will pay you $1,000 every single time you make a 50-yard field goal. <laughs> and he went out to try some extra points. And what ended up happening is that he pulled a quad. Well, I went out there with him, and he started. He went out there with the idea of kicking the 50-yarder to prove it to you. And I was taping a lot of this. Um, but he said, Hey, let's start, you know, let's start with extra points. So he started there. He took five. He made one. He hurt his thigh and his hamstring and he spent the rest of the room with a doctor, the rest of the day with a doctor. That's right. And it yes. was chronicled in song. Yeah. Greg Cody finishes last or Allison? Who wins? Who wins a race? Greg wow. Cody or Allison? Oh, I think Allison beats Greg. Allison, what are you complaining about? Super rude. I mean, you keep saying you're last, you're last. I just don't think you'd be very fast, Allison. I don't think you'd be very fast. I think Allison would beat Mina. Do you? Yeah. I don't think Allison is beating anyone. I think Allison is finishing in last place. (laughs) Super rude. I don't think Greg Cody's going to make it to the finish line. So maybe that, that, I don't think Greg Cody can make it 100 yards. Do you? Uh, No. Not running. How does Sarah Spain do in this, though? I'm thinking she could be... uh... She was an athlete, though. I know. Like, I'm thinking she'd be very fast. That's what I'm thinking. She's top five, I think. Oh, yeah. I'm she'd, definitely she'd top beat five. Half the people in this room, yeah. easy. Yeah. Yeah. You're not top five. No, I'm no. top five. I'm sneaky fast, man. I'm telling you. No, you're not. I am. It's just sneaky. <laughs> Don Lebatard. There was a play at home plate, and this ten year old was rounding third and going home, and I got the ball right before she. Okay. Oh no. She. I threw oh. the ball at her so hard. <laughs> from where? But I got her out. From where? Where were you throwing the ball from? About two feet away. 
I take my kickball seriously, man. Stugatz. But I, it was just reactionary, Dan. <laughs> I caught the ball. There was a play at the plate. I threw it at her. Stugatz, do you? <laughs> and you probably put up two fingers up. <laughs> yeah, we got two down. down. Two, two down. down. We got two down. <laughs> two down, two down. <laughs> this is the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugatz on ESPN Radio. We are a marching band to nowhere. We are a spaceship of BS. A texture writes in, I can't wait for this race, but there's no way it's actually going to happen, is there? I mean, this seems like a pretty easy thing for us to do. It does, yes. To, to schedule a hundred-yard foot race. I mean, the difficult thing. But I thought, I thought getting a camera at the Super Bowl for ESPN right. would be easy, of and course. I was wrong about that. Right. So maybe it's a hard thing to do. But in terms of us having an idea and actually doing it, this seems like a pretty easy one. Uh, it does. The only difficult part is to get all the people involved with this show down here okay. at the same time, okay. meaning well, the guest co-host. Okay. You know? Well, let's see if it's worth the effort. Let's see if it's something we could sell. A hundred-yard race where we fly everyone in from ESPN to find out who the fastest person at ESPN is. If we're doing this like publicly, like as a spectacle, we have to have more than just a 20-second race. Because well, that would be pretty disappointing. Okay. Well, we. Well, I don't think it would be disappointing. I think it'd be. Fu- I think anybody seeing me finish last, that is the reward. Like that. That day is a victory. <laughs> if if we do this and it lasts twenty seconds and I, I can't finish the race right. or I finish last, that is a successful radio event. Or it's just you running into a net. Oh, that's right. Now, if we add the added bonus of at the end of the twenty seconds, I'm going to get caught in a field goal net. And be like a, a, a whale fighting for my existence. You would watch that on television. So after the show today, Stu Gotts, you may be familiar with his work. He is shameless. He is a salesman. He is uh, chummy and smarmy. And on big occasions, we have Stu Gotts call restaurants and request ridiculous reservations. So... Tonight, Valentine's Day, after the show, Stu Gatz is going to call a restaurant mm-hmm. and try and get ridiculous reservations on a night where it's hard to get reservations. But we've done this before on Valentine's Day. Who did we do it with, Billy? Do you remember? We called Canoe in Atlanta uh, last canoe. year. Canoe. Yes, one of my favorites. <laughs> All right. So now keep in mind, again, Stu Gatz is shameless. It's one of the reasons Wilbon probably hates him. Yeah. And... um. And so Stu Gatz will make a call, and he will land these reservations in the most impossible times uh, by being just a jerk. The way this got started was I used to tell Dan and all the guys that this is how I would get reservations on big nights last minute. I would do this off air. I would do it all the time. I do what I got to do to get a reservation. This is not an act. Like this is so, how Stu Gatz does it. It will make your skin crawl. Yeah. So Dan. So I was telling Dan all the time. This is what I do. This is how I do it. Hey, let me get your reservation. You're like, no, I don't want you doing that on my behalf. And then you said, and then I kept bragging about it uh, because I'm proud of it. And that's weird. And you said, hey, let me hear it. Let's do it on air. All right. So I don't know. This was a couple of years ago or last year, but let's go in the Wayback Machine to find out Stu Gatz, how he got. He probably got the reservation because he always does, right? Let's see what happened in Atlanta. Thank you for calling, Stu. This is Vanessa. How may I assist you? Hey, Vanessa. How you doing? Good. Yourself? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for asking. I appreciate that. I wanted to see, Vanessa, if you can help me out. I love the restaurant. I've been there several times. Um, I don't currently live in Atlanta, but I'm going to be there tomorrow for Valentine's Day. And, again, I've been okay. there so many times. I got I got so many friends in the 404, so I'm wondering if uh, if you could help me out. I know this is a last-minute request, but I'm hoping that you can help me out here, okay? Well, we we are completely booked, unfortunately, for our lunch and dinner service. Um My best advice would be to just walk in. We're going to do our absolute best to accommodate walk-ins. We plan on opening up some stuff, but we just can't reserve anything on the books. Are you talking about tonight or tomorrow? Which one are you talking about? Tomorrow. Are you talking about tomorrow night, right? The big night, Valentine's Day. Yeah, you know, because this is, this is the place that, uh, I've been married now. This is going to be our 15th anniversary, and I proposed Aww. actually. Yeah, I proposed at your restaurant. So, <laughs> um, and I, I, being the dope that I am, I waited to the last minute, and so I'm just, I'm a little nervous just walking in there. I feel like I should have a better plan than this. Like my wife, I mean, she might divorce me if I don't get this right. Oh, oh no, no. <laughs> no, I'm serious, Vanessa. I'm serious. Are you married? I, okay. um, I am not, but okay. I well, can certainly you. understand the circumstances. <laughs> right. I can certainly understand the circumstances. Um, I mean, I could try and talk to my manager. I can't make any promises, though. Okay. You know what? Let me speak to your manager real quick. Okay. One okay. second. All right. 
You have not Never said along a the true peaceful thing. Banks of like, you, everything yeah. in here has been a lie. Yep. Here comes some more. At 4199 Paces Ferry Road, Southeast. Thank you for holding. This is Kelly. Hey, Kelly. How you doing? Well, thank you. All right. Listen, I was uh, talking to Vanessa. She's great. I feel like we're friends already, uh, me and Vanessa. <laughs> so, so listen, I got engaged at Canoe, and it's a big, big Valentine's Day for me. And I know I'm calling last minute, but I was supposed to do this about three months ago, and I forgot. Um, uh oh. I know. I know. My wife loves the place. We know so many people in the 404. We love the uh, the Chattahoochee River. And I was hoping that we could uh, we can get a reservation for two tomorrow night. Like this is going to be a marriage saver for me. I, like I'm in big big trouble if I don't get this done. Uh oh. Yeah, um, so it looks like I had something become available at six o'clock. Six o'clock. Well, I was thinking seven thirty. <laughs> um, is there anything available at around seven thirty? No, six no? o'clock is going to be the best I can get. All right, well, let me, uh, perhaps a couple of things here, just uh, some tidbits about me that might be able to to help sway you a little bit. And again, block out that 6 o'clock, because I might end up taking it. Did you say 6 o'clock, right? You said 6? Yes. 6 Mm -hmm. o'clock, okay. I'm looking for prime time, baby, but that's fine. Let's see if we can work (laughs) it out here, okay? What I'm thinking, so there's no easy way for me to do this. I host Mm -hmm. a national radio and TV show for ESPN. Mm -hmm. I'm a big-time celebrity. and I have your name? Oh, my name is Stu Gatz. I do the show with Dan Levitard. Stu Gatz is my yeah. name. Oh, you listen to the show? Yeah, my my husband is a yeah big big sports fan, big ESPN guy. So absolutely. Okay, so if you tell your husband that Stu Gatz is on the line and he's looking for two people at seven thirty, he would say, "Listen, he wouldn't tell you how to do your job, but he'd probably tell you, hey, I'd give that guy the reservation because I have the mm-hmm. ability, unlike whoever has the reservation at 730 right now, I have the mm-hmm. ability to promote you out to millions of people, and I will do it on a daily basis. We are big in Atlanta. Big. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We, are, we are huge in A-Town. We love A-Town. Let's see. All right. A <laughs> couple more things that might sway yeah, you here. Uh, I got. I got a crew. I got a crew. So, like, when I come in, I don't just come in with me and my wife. I usually bring uh, Ron Gant. I usually bring uh, Terry Pendleton, who won an MVP uh, in the National League. Oh, yeah. Pro- yeah, he probably shouldn't have won the MVP that year, but he won it anyway. I'll bring the Pendletons. I'll bring the Webbs. You know Spud, right? Yeah, okay. absolutely. And, uh, like, I'm actually I, from right. Atlanta, so okay. I know all those guys. Oh, yeah, So and I bring the Concacks as well. John Concax is a good friend of mine. So, uh, in fact, last time I was there was with the Concax. Um That's who I was there with, and and uh, and Big Boy. Uh, Big Boy. You know Big Boy from Outcast. Oh, yeah. Yep, we see him. Yeah, yep. his new album's out right now. It's Big Grand. It's available in stores right now. It's uh, He's a good friend of mine. So, we uh, I, like, I'm going to come fully loaded here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. But I only I need, eight I, o'clock is going to be as clo- uh, as close to seven thirty. Eight o'clock. So, wow. So listen, yeah. I'm just gonna. I only need chairs for me and my wife because the Gants and the Concacks, the Pendletons, they just kind of <laughs> like to roam the room, say hi to people, wish them a happy Valentine. So we're good. <laughs> you don't need a bunch of uh, seats for them, just for me and my wife. Okay. And I might bring Greg Maddox. I'm not. Sure. <laughs> Stu, and you spell it S T U or S T U. I mean, this is amazing. What the things I am going to do. For what? you and for this restaurant what? are just, and your husband, by the way, is because <laughs> I felt like I was in a canoe without a paddle. And <laughs> and now I'm not. Now I'm actually sitting in the canoe and I have right. with a table for two. <laughs> I mean, who's better yeah. than me and who's better than you? <laughs> right. Who's better two than you? Two at 8 o'clock tomorrow? Two at 8 o'clock tomorrow. You, and what was your name again? My name's Kelly. Kelly, you are, a, you saved my marriage and you are a sweetheart and I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. It's Dr. Seuss. Canoe for her, too. You like Thanks that, huh? for being you. wonder why Wilbon hates me. Boom, boom. Well, the, the thing, the part the part about that is great, it, and it's a rare achievement. It really is. That is uproariously funny and disgusting. Like, the whole thing is disgusting. I'm listening to it, and I'm actually wondering, put this on the poll, should Stugatz be proud of that? Because he's waving yeah. a finger, and he's like, woo, I'm getting, should Stugatz be proud of that? Charming, too, right? It's, uh, well, I mean, it's, it, I don't know on the spectrum where it is between charming and cheesy. 
Oh, it's cheesy. Yeah, but, yeah, but like, I, I don't <laughs> but know. I've told you forever. You just talk long enough, and you'll eventually get to where you want to get well, to. Well, how are you, you know? going to do it any better than that? First of all, the thing that made me laugh the hardest in there is the concax. <laughs> and I just don't know if that's a reference that anyone in our audience gets. No one. John Concac. Go look up the salary John Concac got as a center for the Hawks. Go give me the numbers on this, and I will tell you, and, and really, it's word association. When I think of John Concac, I think of one of the most ridiculous contracts in the history of basketball. At the time, he was associated with an amount of money that you would never give someone named John Concac. But the numbers have gone so through the roof that I'm guessing when you guys find this, you will laugh uproariously at whatever that number was for John Concac. But I'm telling you that at the time, John Concac was viewed as a catastrophic contract that was idiotic because of how large it was. It was uh, six years, $13 million. <laughs> Think about that for a second. That's the joke Stugatz just made. The Concax. I'm not, that's how long ago that was. John Concax for six years, $13 million was outrageous. Cash more of the Dan Levatar show with the Stugatz. 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio and ESPN U. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I feel like I'm on top of the world. Disclaimer, you will not be transported to the top of the world. In the unlikely event you find yourself at the Arctic Circle, seek shelter from the elements immediately to avoid frostbite and or hypothermia. Geico will not be responsible if you find yourself in a cave or crevasse with a lonely abominable snowman, who in all likelihood will force you to play games including, but not limited to, Go Fish, Charades, Chinese Checkers, or his personal favorite, Red Rover, Red Rover, Send Yeti on over. Geico is not liable for any damages, either physical or emotional. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Don Lebertard. Oscar Robinson had uh, 41 triple doubles back in 61-62. 41. Stugatz. It's Robertson, but... Uh, Big that, O. Okay, but... You... This is the Don Lebertard Show with the Stugatz on ESPN Radio. We love this segment. It's one of our most popular. Our friend Ron McGill with us every week. Zoo Miami. It's become very popular. If you want to get in with him, 786-456-4837. Uh, first things first, because I, I view Ron as a tremendous romantic, a tremendous romantic, like put you all to shame romantic. Yeah, probably. So he's got to do Valentine's Day like a killer, right? Absolutely. Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you, Ron? Well, you know, my wife has got patience late, so she doesn't really get out until about six thirty, seven o'clock. But she doesn't know this. What I've gotten is I've gotten uh, her favorite, which is these huge stone crabs, along with some nice filet mignon. And I've gotten... Literally 150 candles that are going to be leading all the way up to the dinner table into the house I told you. with all of her favorite orchids all around, mm-hmm. her favorite music playing, and I got front row center seat tickets. It's not till July, but I got front row center seat tickets to Chicago and REO Speedwagon together Jeez. where wow. she loves those bands. So I love those bands. Yeah, bro. Well, yeah, yeah. It's a little much, Ron. i got to be honest. It's a fire hazard. I mean, <laughs> I mean, a little much. What you, it's unbelievable. <laughs> no. You're putting us to shame, man. That's what you're doing. How many no, candles? No, no. 150. Yeah, it's a fire hazard, man. No, but they're nice. They're in votives. They're nice little votives that glow red. You know, they're kind of like those nice glowing votives. She loves candles. She really loves candles a lot. And she doesn't get home till like quarter after seven. It's just dark then, so it's perfect. And her favorite music and the orchids, she hates roses because roses just die. So she loves orchids. So I get a ton of orchids. I got them all over the house already. Orchids ain't crabs. cheap, man. Orchids ain't cheap. Brother, let me tell you something. Happy wife, happy life. All right. I, yeah, buddy, right I'm that. celebrating you. You are the best at this. <laughs> How do you keep 150 candles lit? Like, they're going to they're gonna burn out. No, they don't. No, no. They're votives. They're, you know, they're in those nice little votives. Yeah, they yeah. They stay on forever. Yeah. They're really nice. Yeah. And they glow. They're not, they're not like, you know, wax dripping all over the place and stuff like that. That looks a little bit more gothic to me. I like the votives. They're nice, warm glow, perfect music, a little Luis Miguel. She loves that. Hold on a second. M- Miguel, how long have you been married? 30 years. All right, what is the biggest of the Valentine's Day you've done if this is just one you do? Like, if if what you did for this Valentine's Day is your normal, what is your extreme? You know, i got to be honest with you, Dan. I don't usually do an extreme things on Valentine's Day because I think when you do things for holidays, it's kind of like commercialized. What I like to do is I do things for no reason at all. Like, I'll surprise her. Like, I'll, you know, pick her up from work and we'll just drive to the airport and go to an island or something right. uh, with no special day. Right. And, and, and I think that makes... 
Ron, but what, what you did tonight is extreme. Yeah, that is I extreme. Mean, what are you talking Ron? about? That's extreme. It's not really extreme. Listen, guys, it's not extreme. Okay, the tickets, the tickets to the concert, or that was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up because I know she. Ron, loves if that's not extreme, dance. what's your extreme? If that's not extreme, what's Ron McGill's extreme? Um, you know, my extreme would be to pick her up, have a limo waiting in the house, take us to the airport, go to New York, um, have front row tickets to Broadway plays, have a suite at the good top of the, Lord, the zoo business room. Is good. The zoo business is booming. Yeah. Man. No, no, but that would be my dream. It's not, not that I've been able to do that, but that would be my dream. I would love to do that. You know, I'd love to just, but I'd love to do it for no reason at all. I think the, I think when you do those things for no reason at all, they're a lot better than when you do them because you're supposed to do them. I just, I just think it works better that way. Like, you know, every now and then I'll give her a card for no reason. You just leave a card for no reason someplace. And, and those, those, those really, I think those make a difference. As opposed to just birthday, anniversary. You know, listen, I'm not stupid. I got married four days after my birthday. So I know when it's my birthday, I better have all my stuff together for our anniversary. Ron, do, any, an- Ron, do any animals do romance? <laughs> sure, and courtship. Absolutely, there's a lot of courtship that goes on. You know, there's the bower bird that, that he goes out and collects all kinds of brightly colored things, objects, and he brings them to her like he's giving her jewelry and stuff. And, and if she likes it, then he, you know, she comes into his nest, and you know, the rest is history. But there, there's, sure, there's certainly this courtship that goes on in animals. It's really interesting. Which animal is most romantic? Oh, geez, it depends. I mean, if, if you like song, well, look at the birds. Look at some of the songs that birds sing to get to get the attention of a mate. Look at some of the dances some of these birds do. Go and look at planet Earth. Look at, the, at these birds that go back and forth on these, on these limbs and do these things with their feathers, these flash colors and singing. It's, it's, it's unbelievable the kind of demonstration they do to profess their love. Dustin, you're on with Ron McGill of Zoo Miami. Go ahead. Hey, Ron. Uh, my fiancé and I drink a lot of alcohol. I wanted to know how much alcohol it would take to get an elephant drunk. That's a good question. Great question. That's a, that's a really good question, and, and I, I don't really know. I mean, since I've never had a drop of alcohol in my entire life, I, I wouldn't know how much it would take. But I can tell you that animals do get drunk. Um, you know, there's the amarula tree that pre- uh, produces these fruits that become quite fermented, and you see it a lot. You can YouTube it, and you'll see these baboons that start eating these fermented uh, fruits that are just basically all kind of liquored up, and they start you know, swaying back and forth. They can't even walk straight. They look like a typical drunk in the middle of the street. Dare, dare you hazard? Uh, dare you hazard a guess though on elephants? Like, what does an elephant eat a day? Well, an elephant can eat three to four hundred pounds a day. I mean, they they defecate that much in a day, so they're eating at least that much plus the water. So I'm thinking, you know, if you have an elephant that's ten thousand pounds, that's what? That's God? That's you know, a hundred times the average adult woman. So if an adult woman has to have three, four glasses of wine to get there, loop, you go. There you go. Then you're going to have to say, well, that's ten. You know, it's a thousand times that. So you're going to have to have, you know, forty thousand, you know, four thousand, five, five thousand glasses of wine, the equivalent into an. <laughs> that's elephant. the answer. There you go. Don't tell us about the the damn chimps that get drunk. <laughs> There's your answer. Five hundred glasses of wine. No, a thousand. Five thousand. Five thousand, excuse me. That's Benjamin, fine. you're on with Ron McGill. That's a fine. Hi, Ron. Uh, do you use birth control with any of the animals at the zoo? And if so, which ones and how? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, many of the animals are chimps, for instance, have uh, birth control. We initially started with... Um, using the implants, like Norplant. It's an implant that's put under the skin of human women uh, that time releases hormones, convinces the lady she's pregnant so she never ovulates. But it became a challenge with chimps because what the chimps would do is they would pick them out of themselves. Even if you put it in the middle of the back of a chimp, another chimp would come and pick it out. So then we end, uh, ended up vasectomizing the males because these males have been already well represented. They don't need any more of their genetic material spread through the uh, through the area. So we vasectomize the males, but we use implants for things like tigers. A lot of the cats have implants um, that are used. Um, so that, that's the most common type of birth control that we use. But vasectomies are used. We very rarely castrate any animals because by castrating an animal, it, it will lose a lot of its normal um, male traits. You know, if you castrate a lion, for instance, the male thin, uh, the, the mane will thin out. It will fall out. It won't even have a big mane anymore. It loses the musculature. So we vasectomize those animals so they maintain their testosterone levels. They just are not reproductive. It's sort of like how men get married, right? <laughs> like where they just, where they, it's sort of the same thing, right? Where it's like if you no, all right, Charles, you're on with Ron McGill of Zoo Miami. Go ahead. Happy Valentine's Day, Ron. Um, I was watching Thank Blue you. Planet. 
You're welcome. I was watching Blue Planet, and I <laughs> saw a that bag. a fish is able to change its gender from male to female. So I was wondering what other animal can naturally change its gender other than the fish. Uh, there's several reptiles, a lot of lizards. It's called parthenogenesis, and it's basically the ability um, to change sex so you don't, you don't even need a mate. They can actually fertilize their own eggs and produce offspring without ever mating. Uh, they just found that out to happen with a Komodo dragon, which is like, was, was unknown until about a year ago. So Komodo dragons can actually change sex and, and become parthenogenic. In other words, not need a mate to reproduce. This is something that I think may be coming more evident in some species as species become rarer and the animals um, attempt to adapt to not becoming extinct is being able to reproduce itself without having a mate. It's really a, 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 an incredible, incredible thing. Ron a lot McGill. of salamanders do that. Ron McGill with us of Zoo Miami on ESPN Radio. Ron, we were discussing this earlier, and I noticed you didn't wish that guy a happy Valentine's back. Do you feel like it's odd for I, I, a... I did so. I did you so. You said you too. I, so. I mean, you said you too, I think is what you said, right? But do you find uh, it weird? We back. Well, if a guy wishes you a happy Valentine's Day, Dan thinks it's weird. There's no way you think that's weird, right? I don't think it's weird. I just think it's a normal greeting. You know, Dan's got all kinds of phobias about things. I don't know why he gets all... Yeah, I am. That's true. I am phobic about love. I'm phobic about people feeling good. Dana, you're on with Ron McGill of Zoo Miami. Hey, Ron, if you were the host of a 1970s TV dating game show based in a zoo or the wild, where would you send the contestants for their first date, and where would you send them to seal the deal? Oh, wow. Wow. A first date. Um, wow. First date, I would send them to Victoria Falls. The thunder of those falls, the majesty, the mist in the air, the sounds, the rainbow going over the water. And to seal the deal? Wow. This has gotten erotic. Oh, oh um, man. To seal the deal. Oh, I, without I the bring sounds? Them to the falls. Now the, yeah, the thunder of the falls and the mist and the rainbow, and you just you don't rainbow. hear anything else, but you're each other next to you. It's just an incredible experience. I, to seal the deal, I would send them to a place called Zarafa Camp in Botswana. It's a camp that is basically has its own huge... No, no, I take it back. I would send them to the Crater Lodge in the Ngorogoro Crater in Tanzania. It's this huge, beautiful lodge where you have a private room, ceiling to floor windows overlooking the Ngorogoro Crater, huge fireplaces. You got this rain shower, and it's nothing but tons of roses and rose petals all over the place. And all you hear is that outside you hear the lines go, oh, Oh, so you're kind of too scared to go out, but you want to be protected. You have this incredible view of nature as it was 500 years ago in this beautiful place, this majesty of the crackling fire, these animals outside, that feeling that you want to be protected. He protects you. He holds you. He seals the deal. <laughs> well, I am um, I'm aroused and creeped out. I don't, I, I, I'm going to let him go on that note. Let me tell you something. There's nothing more romantic than Africa, guys. There's, I've been there over 50 times. There's nothing more romantic than Africa. If you can't seal the deal in Africa, you are a very sorry soul. Okay, very good. <laughs> right. And on that, uh, happy we, V-Day. Happy V-Day to Ron McGill. We have no video this week. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you guys, it. man. All Take right. care. Bye-bye. Love you, too. Uh, what happened with the, uh, with the video there, Guillermo? What happened? They told us that it was good to go, and then we asked, and they said that they never verified with Ron, so we pulled the plug on that. Okay, so planning again, so it snuck up on us, that segment? Okay, good. Don Lebatard. I don't know anything. Stugatz. I don't remember what I was going to talk about, so in those instances, what I have is a default that just makes fun of Stugatz. You're welcome. This is the Don Lebatard Show with the Stugatz on ESPN Radio. Allison, put it on the poll, please. Is there anyone worse than the guy who keeps referring to Brady or Jordan as GOAT? A texture is writing in here. Is there anyone worse than the guy referring, who keeps referring to Brady or Jordan as greatest of all time, goat? Does it, can't be bothered to say greatest of all time, needs to shorten it to goat. He's so they, the goat. So if you don't know what goat is, you then ask the question and he can tell you cleverly greatest of all time. At this point, everyone knows what the goat is, right? Do no they? one's asking. There's Do no they? follow-ups to the Do goat. They? Is right? that when right? When someone says, yeah, you're the goat, no one's asking what's a goat. Is that true? 
I think so, yeah. Well, at one point, you discovered it, correct? Correct, yes. I know. At one point, I asked someone, so, what's the goat? Okay, right. So everyone <laughs> discovered it at the same time. You did. No, I think everyone now. Now, that was years ago. I know, but I'm saying you have this prism of if I've done it, it's everyone's sensibilities. So you learned it at one time. And you don't think anyone right now is learning that goat is greatest of all time right now on the radio that they've never heard it before. You think that's impossible? Yes. You think there's still people that think goat's bad? Because like, a goat used to be a bad thing. Like Bill Buckner. That's right. Bill Back- uh, Buckner was Bill a Buckner goat. used yeah. to be a goat. There'd be a lot of goats. Chris Weber was a goat. Who's the famous? Scott Norwood's a goat. Yep. Who are the famous goats of all time? When did it switch? That's a great question. See, now we're getting somewhere. So that's Thank a you, legit Chris. question. Thank right, you. Right. Thank you. It switched. No one he told us. There was no memo. Next thing we know, we're all waking up. And no, the greatest it's, a goat is not bad now. It's the best. Right. Whoa, disorienting. Yeah. Buckner's always been the goat, and then suddenly Jordan's the goat. How I about mean, this one? There are people in our audience right now who would just change for them right now. Because they were like, I didn't know that. I thought goats were bad. Let's switch something else. What can we switch? <laughs> I like this idea. Hey, this is good. This got switched. It got switched recently, and no one sent out a memo. Because Brady and Mike, and furthermore, wait a minute. Are Brady and Jordan the only two who get it? Like, Ali got it. Right. But are there any right now? Well, there could only be one goat in each sport, right? So you have Brady, Jordan. But does Trout get it? Trout's not getting it. Cabrera's not getting it. Gretzky. Gretzky got it. Who's doing that in hockey now? Because it's not a, it's not a Vegkin. Is it Crosby? Like, no, there's no greatest of all time in hockey right now, is there? No. Wait a minute. What happened to the absence or the endangered species of greatest of all time? Where are they? Gretzky ended it in hockey. Wait I think. a minute. Ended it? Yeah, and so did Jordan. Is Babe Ruth the goat? Oh. No, he's not. Overrated. And black. According to Stugatz's personal record book. That is correct. We're working on that. This is an excellent question, though. Just like I'd like to know, when did Valentine's Day start? Was that the creation of a card company? When did the day of Valentine's Day start as February 14th? And when was the day that GOAT went from being Bill Buckner to being Michael Jordan and Tom Brady? Serena's the GOAT. Yes. Stephen A's the GOAT. Were you and Chris going to say Stephen A at the same time? It depends on what Chris is going to say. I was starting to say Stephen Stephen A. That's yeah. crazy. Well, wait a minute. We say Stephen A is the GOAT. I don't know that everyone says that. So what's a bad thing that we can switch? Like a poop emoji? Make that a good thing now? Uh. Uh, it is weird. This is a good point by Chris. The fact that this changed and the fact that there are people in our audience who don't know that it's changed until this very minute is something that happened in what? The last 15 years? 10 years? Tom Brady was pictured in GQ holding a goat. Was he not? That was like six or seven years ago. He knew. I think Jordan was the first goat. Really? He came before, obviously, he came before Brady. Ali, no one ever called Ali a goat. Jordan does have to be the goat, but why did we start doing that? Who started doing that? How did it become popular? All those answers, not likely to be had. Next. Don Lebatard. Pistachios are highly flammable when stored in large quantities and can spontaneous combust. Stugatz. Spontaneous Lee. Nope. Spontaneous. Lee. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. You are a national treasure. Thank you. Do you realize how hard it is to make that that funny? Thank you. Uh, Chris Sims with us. Chris Sims. Showering me with compliments. <laughs> Valentine's Day. I love it. <laughs> Some people are writing in here that LL Cool J, his album, uh, 2000, that's when Goat uh, made an appearance for the first time. Do we have a definitive answer on this? When did it change? Uh, greatest of all time, the goat. Yeah. So I, 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 the first time I ever heard "goat" out of anybody's anybody's mouth was Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice at the end of the '90s, and even in my early career, when he used to come and even talk to John Gruden, at times Gruden would go, "Hey, I just got off the phone with the goat," and I was like, "Who are you talking about?" And he's like, "Jerry Rice." And Jerry self-proclaimed himself the goat a while ago. That was the first time I heard it really being called that on a regular basis. Wasn't asking you. Yeah. Uh, Billy, do oh, we have any? No, that's okay. Answer. That's good okay. That's a good Billy, answer. Billy, what is the answer to the question? So according to Gramophobia, in 1992, Muhammad Ali's wife like licensed G-O-A-T to kind of shorten the greatest of all times, Inc. So 1992, Muhammad Ali. Wow. Nice. All right. Good answer. 
So do we owe them royalties? Like, how does that, what happens there? No, because you use it? I don't know how that one works, actually, because yeah. Michael Buffer has some sort of royalty. He does. Yeah, no, that's what where, I'm saying. Yeah, let's get ready to rumble. If you use that phrase in, in some sort of context without crediting him, uh, yeah, he gets paid for that. So I don't think that that's for GOAT, though, although I don't care about this subject anymore. All right. Number 25 <laughs> on Chris Sims' top 25 quarterbacks. We've gone through this list here. It started at 71. 71 was Cody Kessler. Blake Bortles was number 70. And now we've got Eli Manning at 38 behind Geno Smith. And the last five are Patrick Mahomes at 30, Josh McCown at 29, 28 is Jacoby Brissett, 27 is Ryan Tannehill, 26 is Tyrod Taylor, and the number 25 best quarterback in the universe, according to Chris Sims of Bleacher Report, is... Oh, it's a special day. It's Andy Dalton, oh. Cincinnati Bengals. Valentine's oh, Day. Oh, that's man. too high. Man. No, happy Valentine. I'm furious with you right now. <laughs> Red like, rifle. AJ Green, that guy should have been out of the league three years ago. And this is using the math that you use on Blake Bortles in terms of how much he limits that offense, Chris. Well, I, I'm not going to say that totally because he still can throw the ball down the field effectively. This is a guy that went to the playoffs four years in a row. I do think we are a little harsh on him because they are not capable of winning that one game. Hey, he's going to have to, I think he is going to have to fight for his job with AJ McCarron, who I had, you know, there around 34 or 35, somewhere in that range. But regardless, I do think he deserves the respect to at least be in the top 25. He's a pretty good athlete. He's got a pretty good arm. It's a pretty quick release. He hasn't had a great offense around him. I know he's had A.J. Green. Hold on. Uh, hold on. But those hold are, my, those are my, my uh, you know, points there. The best year he had, he had the best offensive line in football and was never hit. And help me with this because I will sure. defer to you and your analysis on this. I never understand how to untangle a number one receiver from the greatness of a quarterback, but I feel like like AJ Green is the cheat code that that he should be even better and that he's not because of Dalton. Well, I, well, listen. There, early in the career, early in Dalton's career, I would I would agree with that statement. I think you're a hundred percent. Yes, he couldn't take advantage of some of AJ Green's skill set opening down the field. The last few years, I would say. A.J. Green's problems are more because Cincinnati is just not creative on the offensive side of the ball to find him cheap ways a la Antonio Brown or some of the other great receivers where they get these easy four- and five-yard completions and screen passes and all those type of things where they – uh, for some reason, I don't know why, we'll just put A.J. Green out on the right side of the formation, you know, 65 out of 70 snaps and go, well, if you get single coverage, we'll throw it to you. If you don't, then we might not throw to you all game. And that's what kind of happens to him from time to time. So I look at it as more of an offensive scheme issue in Cincinnati as pertaining to that conversation. Okay, so let's keep the coach and the quarterback exactly the same <laughs> and the scheme to boot. Okay, great. Uh, Chris, thank you for being on with I'm us. I'm doing the number, like I'm running numbers on this because you got 24 to go. Go. There's going to be a big name not on this list. I'm telling you. Okay. There has to be. You're running numbers. I yes. thought Andy Dalton wasn't going to be on this list. I don't think there's <laughs> going to be a big name missing. I'm, I'm right now, I've never been angrier at Chris Sims. Thank you for being uh, on with us, Chris. But thank you. I'm sorry to disappoint you on such a special day. All right. Happy V-Day. Say happy V-Day. Uh, Dalton. What are your thoughts there, though? Seriously. Like I, you want my thoughts on the well, quarterback no, rankings? No, no, this is this is where I want your thoughts. Where I want your thoughts is on the idea of at the quarterback position. I feel like there are a lot of guys. If we throw them in there, the next thing we're going to be seeing is, in certain circumstance, Case Keenum or Nick Foles. You put them with the right team, and all of a sudden, Nick Foles becomes something more special than he was. And so. In Cincinnati, I believe, now I could be wrong about this, but I believe A.J. Green to be as unguardable as anything that has ever played the position. I could be wrong about this. Okay. Including and Jerry Rice? I'm saying, like, I'm saying that that guy, I feel like the same way that Julio Jones allowed Matt Ryan to make a leap. Matt Ryan has largely been Ryan Tannehill, and then Julio Jones got there. Right or wrong? No, I think that's fair. And then Matt Ryan became, oh, this guy can be an MVP of a league. 
And under certain circumstances, certain quarterbacks can make that leap with a number one wide receiver. And what I'm telling you is Dalton has had one his entire career, and I feel like wasted him. That the only reason Andy Dalton is as high on this list is because he's gotten an opportunity that a lot of Ryan Lindells would have wanted. I mean, quarterbacks, many quarterbacks would give anything to have a receiver like A.J. Green. Like anything. I'm not even sure Ryan Lindell is a quarterback. Is he a quarterback or a kicker? I think he's a kicker. Either way. Fine. I corrected it myself. Nobody else corrected me. You can't find me for something no one else corrected. You guys just stared at me. I made the own correction on Ryan Lindell. I made him a great quarterback, even though he's a kicker, with A.J. Green as his wide receiver. That's what happened. Sounds like a quarterback name. It does sound like a quarterback's name. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the assistant. We have had a ton of polls today at Levitard Show. Has anyone noticed... You tell me, Stu Gatz. Has it been noticed? Because Lord knows the text machine and the Twitter machine, they fill up when I'm talking race issues. Fill up. We haven't had any complaints like that in months. Do you guys even notice when we're not talking race? Because I don't feel like you do. So here's Greg Popovich Popovich for you to shove a little bit of it in your face. Great. Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, The league is uh, made up of... uh, a lot of black guys, you know, so to honor that and understand it is pretty simplistic. Uh, how would you ignore that? But more importantly, you know, we live in a racist country that hasn't figured it out yet, and it's always important to bring attention to it, uh, even if it angers some people. You know, the point is that you have to keep it in front of everybody's nose so they understand it still hadn't been taken care of, and we have a lot of work to do. So, God, it's funny or not funny to end every segment for the rest of the week with just non-explained Greg Popovich one sentence of we live in a racist country. Like, just end every segment that way. Uh, just Greg Popovich's voice, yes or no, it's funny if every segment for the rest of the week ends this way. We live in. 